Okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about machine learning. In particular, we're going to be talking about um, a very common method for building classifiers called Naive Bayes. Um, don't panic from this cartoon. I had someone last time ask whether or not there was a quiz today. There's not actually a quiz. It's just a cartoon. But we are going to be talking about how a robot, not you, uh, should learn from data in order to do well on an exam. So up till now, if you look back on the course, we've really done two big units. The first part of the course was really about making decisions. Sometimes those decisions were kind of all about predicting the long-term consequences. Maybe there were adversaries. Maybe there was a sequence of actions you needed to take and search. It was all about choosing what action to take. The middle part of the course was all about how to deal with the fact that not everything about the world is observed to you, and you need to reason about some variables using other variables. So it was really all about reasoning. Um, and in particular, reasoning with uncertainty. This last part of the course is going to be about um, how, from data and from experience, you should go about learning about your world. We've already seen a little bit of this. So when we saw reinforcement learning, there was not only action selection and reasoning, there was also a little bit of experiencing good versus bad rewards and using those to inform your knowledge of how the world works. In this last uh, machine learning unit, we're really going to dig into that. And then for the very last couple lectures, we'll go back and do a tour of a lot of the big, um, the big successes in AI recently in the real world. And now we'll go and kind of, now that we know what these basic foundational techniques are like, we'll be able to see how systems like uh, autonomous cars or machine translation work using a lot of the ideas that uh, we've, we've looked at in class. OK, so there's a lot of kinds of machine learning. Um, a lot of what we're going to look at is about learning parameters. For example, if you have a Bayes net, how do you figure out what the specific probabilities are? But there's other kinds of learning. For example, learning structure. You have variables and you don't know how they relate. Which variables influence which others? That's about learning um, uh, the kind of structural influences in your domain. And then um, the last thing we're going to talk about, though not today, is learning hidden concepts or latent information. And this is uh, exemplified by things like clustering, where you have a bunch of data and you want to discover patterns. You don't actually know in advance what you're looking for, doing things more explorat uh, exploratorily. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is what's called model-based classification. That means we're going to be classifying. That means we're going to be predicting some random variable. And what model-based means is we're going to leverage what we know about Bayes nets. Starting next class, we're going to actually throw away the probabilistic interpretation and learn how to directly classify on the basis of errors and talk about error minimization. But for today, we're going to introduce classification, and we're going to do it uh, in the context of Bayes nets, since we've built up all this machinery already. So what's classification about? Classification is about building kind of automated systems that look at a bunch of decisions and make them in an automated way. And so one example for that might be something like a spam filter that's supposed to go through all of your inbox message by message, read them at lightning speed, and decide whether or not they should be put in your spam folder. OK, so um, there are lots of kinds of classification problems. Uh, spam filter is going to be one of our two running examples for the next few lectures. In a spam filter, the input uh, might be an email, right? so an email you've received to your account. And the output is kind of thumbs up or thumbs down. Is this spam? That's thumbs down. That's bad. It means you don't want to read it. Um, or is it a good email? And the spam classification people have decided that the good thing is ham, right? Because you know spam is, you guys know what spam actually is? Like, it's like canned gelatinous ham, right? And then there's real ham. That's the analogy here. So if you've never heard this ham thing before, it's good emails. So what's the setup? The setup here is you're going to get some massive quantity of emails. From where? I don't know. You're going to get a whole bunch of emails, and each one is going to be labeled for you uh, with a correct label that it's either spam or ham. Eventually, you want to build a system that does this automatically, that takes the emails and makes the predictions. But in order to teach a system to do this, you need to give it training examples. And we'll talk more about how those training examples um, enter into the process. But the setup for classification is you have a decision you want to make, and you have examples of that classification being made. Now, Who's going to label thousands, millions, billions of emails as spam or ham? Actually, do you guys know how, how do, say, at, uh, say, for something like Gmail, they have a spam filter. How did they get all of these labelings of what's spam or not? Yep. Yeah, they, they get you to do it. This is the beauty. They, you have this little button that says uh, mark as spam, which is really a button that says provide as training data to the classifier, right? 
So um, they've gotten you to do this. Now, there's all kinds of subtleties. And for example, you don't mark every possible um, spam as spam. You only do some. Some users do this more than others. Sometimes people decide they don't like their friend anymore, and they mark all their emails as spam, and now you've got some bad data. And the flip side is, you don't really have a mark as not spam button. Yes, occasionally you'll go to your spam filter, and you'll kind of rescue something by dragging it out. So this isn't the cleanest um, way of getting data, but it's a great way to do it at scale. There are other ways. The standard way you collect data is you sit some people who know a lot about the task, so maybe some spam email experts. You sit them down, and you say, OK, I'm going to pay you however much an hour to go through email messages clicking the yes and the no button. Right? So how you collect this data, um, if you're lucky, you can trick you know, uh, the, the world into doing it for you, but often you have to actually commission the data. And a big part of using classification in practice is the expense that goes into figuring out what my data should look like, collecting it, and in the real world, even things like if you're going to build a spam classifier, do you actually have, um, do you actually have the rights to look at those emails uh, that you want to train on and so on? So um, there are a lot of issues kind of surrounding the use of classification that are really important. What we're going to talk about here is pretty much just once you have this data set, how do you then do the kind of algorithmic design and the statistics in order to then build the classifier? OK, so you want to learn to predict new labels on future emails. Not just these, right? No one's presented with you an ex with an exhaustive list of every email that will ever be received. If they did, classification would be easy. You'd just have a big checklist. You'd look up this email, and you'd see what the expert said. The problem is you're getting all kinds of new emails, and you somehow need to make decisions on the new emails on the basis of the old emails. And so there's going to have to be something that connects them, and that's going to be what are called features. So features in classification are the attributes that are used to make the decision, in this case, whether or not it's spam. The obvious features might be look at the words in the email. So for example, if the word free in uh, all caps with an exclamation point is in your email, is that a sign of spam or ham? Probably spam, not necessarily, right? So this is what's called a weak indicator. We imagine that we'd actually have to go look at the data to make sure our intuitions are actually right, because we don't just type probabilities in by hand. We'd have to go look at the data, but it seems reasonable to think that the word free, especially in all caps, is a sign of a spam email. But it's not like you can write a rule that says, if the word free is in my email, delete it instantly, right? Because then you know your friend uses the wrong word, and suddenly you don't get that email. And so this is a big issue with classification, is in general, you've got lots and lots of cues of, uh, in, to what the right decision is. Does it contain the word free? Is it in all caps? Does it contain a dollar sign with some digits after it? There are going to be non-text kind of features like, is the sender in your contacts list? Is it, a, is it good or bad for an email to have a sender in your contacts list? Think about it. Yeah, it's probably good, right? If it's somebody you know, it's probably not spam. But of course, you don't want to delete everything that's from someone who isn't in your contacts list. And so um, what you have is you're going to have a large number of features, each of which gives a tiny bit of weak evidence towards the decision. And you need to somehow kind of add up all this evidence in some way. So it'll actually be more like multiplying it. Um, so OK, for example, over here on the right, we have some emails. This is from an actual data set that people used in the research community for a while um, to, uh, to look into spam properties. Um, the top one, dear sir, first I must solicit your confidence in this transaction. This is by virtue of its nature of being utterly confidential and top secret. Spam or ham? It's spam, but look, look, it's like it's written so politely. No, that's spam. Um, Next one, to be removed from future mailing, simply reply to this message and put remove in the subject. 99 million email addresses for only $99. That's a pretty good deal. Um, spam or ham? Okay, that's bad too. Um, so, but you'll notice like, the fact that there's an unsubscribe option, that might actually be a good sign in and of itself. And then you get to the 99 million email addresses and you kind of you know it's over for. Um, okay, here's one. Okay, I know this is blatantly off topic, but I'm beginning to go insane. Had an old Dell Dimension XPS sitting in the corner, blah, blah, blah. Spam or ham? OK, Sam, do you want this email? You don't want this email. OK. Um, that doesn't mean it's spam. This is actually a, a big deal with spam classification in general. Not everybody draws the line in the same place. Maybe that kind of offer that you get every morning from the pizza store is something you want, but maybe your friend doesn't want it at all. And so whether or not that's spam is really uh, a tricky thing. However, in this case, maybe we come up with a canonical notion of, for most people, would these things be spam or ham? Um, this is separate from the decision of uh, which friends you want emailing you. OK, so well, that's our data. Um, and then we try to automate that process, something that reads this email, looks at the words, look at whether or not the, the sender is in your contacts list, counts the number of capital letters, whatever the features are going to be, and then makes a decision based on, based of the, on the evidence. 
So another example that we're going to have as a running example and that will also be in your project fives is digit recognition. So in digit recognition, the input is um, a picture. Right? It's going to be an image of a digit. You can think of it as a little matrix of pixels. And the output is going to be a class. In this case, the class might be 0 through 9. In a more complicated character recognition task, your input might actually be the whole page, and you might have to, the output might be a long string of words. OK, but for now, we're going to think about just a single isolated square that has a digit in it. So what's the setup here? We're going to get a big collection. You always start with the data. Get a big collection of example images. Um, and each one we're going to label. Now, how are we going to do this? We're probably going to have to sit down and look at it as humans and, and basically demonstrate to the machine this is what we want to do. Right? This one, this one's a 0, and this one's a 1, and this one's a 2, and this one's a 1. And we're going to have to label all of that. And there's some expense to that. It's time consuming. It's hard to figure out. Um, and then it's time. Um, once you've, once you've kind of collected all of this data, and in general, by the way, the best way to make a classifier better is to collect more data. And so there is a real cost here if you want to build good classifiers. Um, so now you want to build some function that predicts the label of some new digits, like this thing on the bottom. What is that? OK, actually, what is that? I don't know. It's like it's either a 0 or a 2. Sometimes it's not obvious. And actually, when, even when humans annotate data, sometimes, even on the training set, you won't agree. Like, I, I'm not actually sure what this is supposed to be. And I might think it's a 0, but I might be wrong. Um, so there are gonna be some, there's going to be some noise in the training set. That'll be important later. Uh, and the noise in the training set is something that these algorithms have to absorb. Um, so we get a lot of data. We figure out what the features are. For example, in this case, the feature um, features might be, is pixel 6, 7 on? Right? And so certain pixels will indicate certain numbers with, with differing strengths. Right? Um, but we could imagine more sophisticated features. And actually, a computer vision person would look at this and come up with some kind of very sophisticated features. Some crude ones might be, how many connected components uh, are, the, are there in the ink? Uh, what's the aspect ratio of the bounding box of the thing? Right? Ones are, are skinny, but zeros are wide. Um, how many loops are there, right? Uh, things like that. And um, we could talk, we could spend a whole lecture on how you can come up with good features in an image that strongly indicate the classification. But you get the idea here. You come up with some features. Um, they characterize each of, these, um, each of these data points in a way that you can use to generalize to future ones. OK, spam uh, and digit recognition. We're going to use them over and over again. Any questions on those? OK. So um, classification is everywhere. It's actually an incredibly important uh, commercial technology. I would say, just kind of my, based on my industry experience, that of all of the algorithms that you study here, the one you are most likely to find yourself implementing is uh, the stuff on classification. Right? This really gets used all over the place in all kinds of, uh, in all kinds of um, industry contexts. So we talked about spam. We talked about character recognition. But you can really be making almost any kind of prediction. So medical diagnosis, the input would be a set of symptoms, and the output might be a disease. You can do essay grading. Um, the input is a document, and the output is a, you know, a letter grade. And actually, turns out you can grade essays pretty reliably uh, by a machine like this. Now, it depends what you're grading for, and there's some subtleties there. But there are surprisingly many cases where the classification technology we're going to talk about here can be adapted successfully to these tasks. Fraud detection, every time you swipe your credit card, right? The, um, features of the transaction are being looked at to try to detect fraud. That's a very important um, piece of uh, the credit process. Customer service email, you send some email to a company, and there's some chance that the classifier will decide it knows what you want and send you a response, um, and so on, right? And there's really kind of classifiers everywhere. Uh, and I really kind of can't emphasize enough, you, there is a pretty good chance you'll find a, a, a case in, in your careers where you'll uh, want to build something like this. OK, so um, that's kind of the general setup. We're going to talk about today is a specific way of doing classification. So somebody hands you a data set. You know for each instance what the features are. And you want to build some kind of function that maps you from these features to the output. right? So it's all about building a function from features to outputs that generalizes well to new data. And today, the way we're going to talk about doing that is in a model-based way. We'll talk about a model-free way next time. Um, and really, in this case, um, although if you remember back, we had the same distinction in reinforcement learning, where there was model-based reinforcement learning, where you learned an MDP and then solved it. And that was kind of a sideshow. Most people use model-free reinforcement learning. In the world of classification, actually, both things are used. And what I'm going to talk about today, which is an uh, uh, approach called naive Bayes, is um, it's still really the workhorse for classification. In most cases, it's what people build in the real world, despite years and years of research on things that are uh, slightly better uh, in some axes. OK, 
So in model-based classification, you have some phenomenon like spam that you want to um, you want to predict, and so you're going to build a model in which that phenomenon is a random variable. So uh, when we say model, we mean Bayes nets in this case. So you're going to build a Bayes net in which some of the random variables represent the features, so the words in the document or the pixels or whatever. Um, and there is also a variable in your model that represents the decision you're trying to make, or the classification you're trying to make, uh, like spam versus ham or the digit. So what you do is you have this Bayes net. Um, features are random variables, and so when you observe that there are three connected components, you go to the connected component random variable, you assign it the value three, that's instantiating or observing a variable in your Bayes net, you instantiate all of the features you have, and then you compute using Bayes net inference, you compute the distribution over the label variable conditioned on the features. Right? So you're going to fall back on all of the things we've been doing for the past uh, couple weeks on Bayes nets. Now, there's some questions you're going to have to answer, like what should our structure be? We have all these random variables. Um, we have all these random variables. We want to know um, how they're connected. And also, remember, Bayes nets have parameters, like what is the probability that a spam email contains the word um, free? Right? Who knows? 1%, a thousandth of a percent? You've got to get the st stuff from data. OK. Um, so here it is. Uh, basically, the the graph you draw, the Bayes net you draw, is the simplest Bayes net that could possibly work. And that is uh, the Bayes net that's shown here, where you say your variable that you're trying to classify into, spam versus ham or, or digits, that's y here. So that's y. Um, and that variable is connected to each random variable that represents a feature. So if you have n features, each one's a random variable. right? They may be Boolean, whether or not that feature is present. They may be many-valued, like uh, how, many, um, how many connected components there are. That would be a feature that might, have, you know, it might be integer-valued. And each one of these features is a random variable in the network as well. And then the typical case is you know all of the features because they're observed. Um, you extract them from the uh, input, and then you do a query that computes the probability of y given all of the features. Now, the structure here says that each feature is connected up to the hidden variable by a simple arc. right? So you don't have anything where kind of one feature is considered to have some influence on another feature. You've assumed that um, the features are not independent in this model, but they are conditionally independent given the class. That's a very strong assumption. right? So if you think about, let's zoom in on a Let's zoom in on a, a, a digit, right? And so if you, you're kind of underlying digit, well, it's in some grid, so it might look like, you know, here's, here's part of a, this might be a big number one, right? And it might look like that. These are the, the uh, I don't know, I can't, okay, so I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not good at pixel art, but you get the idea. Here are the pixels that are on in a one. And if you say, what are the chances that, kind of this pixel is on, and where are the chances that this pixel is on? Those aren't independent, right? Because there's some splotch of ink, and wherever the ink is, kind of the adjacent pixels are probably pretty, uh, are probably going to be on too. So even conditioned on the class, you're not going to necessarily have that all of the pixels are conditionally independent. So this model has an extremely strong independence assumption. When we get to spam, we're going to see it, it's even more ridiculous. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is what people use for classification. It turns out to work pretty well because the errors in the independence assumption are in some sense, uh, it, in many cases, they are, um, they're not the kinds of dependencies that would change the classification. I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to, to uh, the spam case. But okay, let's think about what this, this naive Bayes model means here. It means you have a feature, um, you have a, a random variable f for each feature, and in the simplest set of features, you just have uh, f this is for digit recognition, you just have one feature for each pixel in the grid. So you would have one random variable fij for each position ij. Now, you might imagine those have kind of real value because they might be in grayscale, but for simplicity and in your projects, let's imagine that the features are either on or off. So each one of these pixels is considered to be either on or off based on maybe some threshold in the underlying intensity. And that means that when you get the image, right, the image is some little you know, uh, PNG file or something like that, you have to then do some computation to compute a vector of features that characterizes it. So in this case, it would just be looking up for each pixel, whether or not the pixel's on and off. But you might have to search for connected components, which might involve running a search. right? And so you might have to do actually quite a lot of computation. But this tiny little arrow here can represent kind of arbitrary feature computation. You do whatever computation you need, and now you can throw away your image. You're left with the features that summarize it. 
Okay, so here you have this vector of, uh, for each image, you have a feature, uh, sorry, for each pixel in the image, you have a Boolean that indicates whether or not that pixel's on or off. So you have lots of features in this case, right? Um, and each one's gonna be binary valued. What is the naive Bayes model? It says that um, you're gonna be computing the conditional distribution on Y, given all of those features, right? And that's gonna be proportional to your joint probability, which in this naive Bayes model, we can read it off of the structure of the Bayes net. It's the probability of Y, because Y doesn't have any parents in this model, times the probability of each feature given the class. So that's these guys. Each feature given the class. So you get one number that enters into your score for each feature that tells you whether or not that feature is kind of a good fit for that class, right? So you start with a number that says, is this class common? That's called the prior. And then you multiply in one number per feature that's kind of a score about whether or not this hypothesis fits that evidence, right? It's the same kind of evidence function we saw in HMMs. All right, so that's the model. Uh, it's, a, it's, called, uh, it's called Bayes because it's a Bayes net, and it's called naive because we've made the assumption that the features are conditionally independent given the class. And we'll see later that that's just totally crazy. Um, so maybe it should have been called Crazy Bayes. I actually think it'd be a great name. Um, but it still works really well. All right, uh, so what do we need to learn, right? I just told you the structure of the Bayes net. At this point, I don't even need to show you the slide on how to do inference because it's just a, Bayes, it's a simple Bayes net. You should be able to plug and chug given the conditional probability tables and be able to um, kind of compute the conditional distribution of y given the f's. But what you need to learn now is you need to learn the parameters. Okay, so um, here's the general case. In the general case for naive Bayes, you have a random variable that represents the class, right? Spam or ham or which disease or whatever it is. That goes at the top of the model. And all of the features kind of causally, if we think about these arrows as causal things like we did in Bayes nets, we imagine the processes, the, the underlying uh, variable y gives rise to each feature independently, right? That's the assumption. So this represents a joint distribution over all of those random variables, the random variable for y and all of the random variables for the features. And it does so with a very aggressive factorization that says, okay, p of y, right? Um, and then product of each f depends only on y, not on the other features directly. Okay, that's very aggressive because in any real domain, the features are gonna have interactions that are um, not mediated by the variable y. So it's almost certainly gonna be wrong as a kind of a uh, causal model. But what's nice about it is it's super compact. So over here, right, here's a joint distribution over n plus one variables. How big is it? Well, um, for every value of y, for every value of f1, for every value of f2, for each of these combinations, there's a joint probability at some number. It's probably gonna be a pretty small number because there's a lot of entries here. Okay, but how big is it? Well, there's uh, y values for y, whatever that is, it's usually gonna be at least two, times um, uh, for each, kind of times the size of f1, times the size of f2, right? And so if these are all uh, Boolean, then this is gonna be, you know, this part over here is gonna be two to the n, or it could be much, much bigger because there might be more than two values for each f. But this thing's gonna be exponential in the number of whatever you do, is gonna be exponential in the number of features. And so if you just tried to learn all these probabilities, this wasn't gonna work, right? There are just exponentially many, many ways you can put these features together. Whereas if you go over here, well, p of y, that's not that big, that's just size of y, right? That's one probability for each y. And then each one of these features given y, how big is that? Well, that is a distribution over fi, which is gonna be size of fi numbers, and how many do you get? You get one for each value of the parent y. So it's size of fy times size of y, and of course you don't just get one of these, um, you're gonna get one for each i, so there's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be n of these. Okay, but that's actually much better. On the right, the number of uh, conditional probabilities that go into your computation is linear in the number of classes you have, and that's a big victory over the thing on the left where there's exponential. Everybody with me on that? This is actually, it's not only deep, it's maybe deeper than you think. Okay, okay so probably everybody's with me on to level one of the depth, which is we don't wanna have anything that's exponential in size, so let's get something that's, that's, that's more compact. That's reasonable, we don't have exponentially much memory. But it's actually more than that. It's even if we didn't care about memory, which we do, and even if we didn't care about compute time, which we do, there's another reason why you don't ever wanna be in the position of learning something that's really big, like something exponentially big, big like that. And that is, every time you have an experience, you can only learn so much from that experience, statistically speaking. 
And if you're trying to learn exponentially many numbers, you kind of have to have exponentially many experiences. And that's very slow. It means you would need an incredible amount of data. Whereas on the right, when you only have a linear number of, uh, of parameters to learn, it means you don't need as much data to support them. So there's also a kind of efficiency that's called statistical efficiency that talks about how much data you need to be sure you have the right numbers in your model. And that's a new kind of efficiency that normally we don't think about as computer scientists, but it's super important. And that's actually one of the big reasons why Naive Bayes works really well, is because if all you have to learn is how likely it is that a spam email has the word free, you can do it on a reasonable size corpus. Whereas if you need to learn how likely it is that a spam email has the word free, given that there are 78 words in the email and it was sent on December 3rd, 1920, right? I guess there's no email in 1920. In some number where there's email, there's, that's really hard to do because you might only have one email or zero emails that match that. Whereas if you just wanted to kind of look at all your spam and count the number of free, that's really easy to do statistically speaking. Okay, so new kind of, uh, new kind of efficiency that we don't normally talk about. All right. Um, okay. One last thing I'm going to say about inference, just because this is something that's recurred and it's good to see it over and over again, and that is um, formally we are computing. Um, a probability of y, right, and I keep y as a capital because I want the whole distribution over y, meaning I want a probability for each value of y. I want that distribution over y given all of my feature values, whatever they are, f1 through fn, and that's going to depend on, on the features in the, particular, um, in the particular classifier. Whenever I want to compute a conditional probability, right, there are some exceptions, but basically, um, in general, when I want to compute a conditional probability over a variable given evidence, I instead compute the corresponding joint probability. It's still a vector of numbers, one for each y, except they're joint numbers, and so they don't sum up to one. Right? And this is always going to be the recipe. You want a conditional probability, first compute the corresponding joint probability, and then normalize. And so if you want this vector of probabilities, one for each y, joint with the evidence, that's this vector. We don't usually write this out, so I think it's helpful to see it written out. The first element is the probability of, of the first class with all the evidence, then the probability of the second class, and you get one number for each of the, uh, for each of the classes y. OK, how do you compute these? For each one of these joint probabilities, we go back to the, the, the Bayes net, and we say, OK, that Bayes net was shaped like this. And a Bayes net shape like that factors in a certain way, a probability of the root, which is y, times the product of each leaf given the root. Okay, And that means we multiply this number, and we multiply this number. And for each of the k classes, we then multiply all of the n features. And then we end up with this vector of, uh, uh, of these k, k numbers stacked vertically. Okay. Um, now again, anytime you want a conditional probability, you compute the vector of joint probabilities. This is this, right? Um, the vector of joint probabilities, and then you normalize, which means you sum it up and divide by its sum. In this particular case, we know what the sum is going to be. Because if I look at this uh, probability here, and if I sum out all the values of y, I know it's just going to be the probability of the rest of the variables, which is the evidence f1 through fn. Okay, that's why this trick of computing the joint probability vector and then normalizing works, is because the joint probability vector, if you follow this recipe, is always going to be what the denominator should have been in uh, the conditional. Okay, but in any case, you compute all of these products, right? For each class, you compute a product of prior probability and evidence probabilities, and then you normalize them, and that gives you your answer. We'll see an example, but any questions before we do that? Okay. Um, so in order to use a naive Bayes classifier, like you're out there, you're on the job, and somebody tells you, we're going to build a classifier to decide um, whether or not uh, you know whether or not um, this user application is fraudulent, right? Something like that. Is this person a person or are they a bot? Okay. So what are you going to need? Right. You already know what naive Bayes is mathematically. So what do you still have to do? You're going to have a bunch of probabilities in the end. You're going to multiply them together in the appropriate ways, and that's going to give you the predictions. So predicting with the model is easy. All of the interesting stuff is now learning what the numbers are from your data. OK, and so what are the things we're going to have to learn? We're going to have to learn for each class what's the prior or marginal probability of that class. So that's P of Y. And for each feature, we're going to have to learn how the classes and features interact. So for each feature, we're going to need to learn the response of that feature, how likely it is to have its various, um, its various outcomes for each class. So there's, there's going to be a matrix of classes linking up to features, and that's going to be your evidence function. Together, all these conditional probabilities are called the parameters of the model. 
right? So you think of them as probabilities. They're just kind of there. But you know, there's some probabilities that are the right ones and some are the wrong ones. We need a name for a, an in, for a collection of probabilities, and we call that theta. That's the parameters of the model. Up until now, we basically assumed that when somebody writes down a Bayes net, the probabilities are in there, right? Each little variable has a little box that contains all of the probabilities that should be there. Um, now our job is to populate that box. So like the probability ferry that we've had up until now, now we have to build that. The short answer is they come from the counts in the data. We'll look at that in a bit. So let's take a look at what these conditional probabilities that are the parameters of a Bayes net, uh, of a naive Bayes classifier look like. So let's say you're classifying something like this. We said one thing you need is a probability distribution over the digits. One probability distribution over the digits is one where they're all equally likely, 0.1. There are many other distributions over the digits 0 through 9, right? And if you're doing digit classification, this is probably not the right one. Okay, so um, if you're just doing general digits, does, it, does anybody actually know? It's not, it's not actually uniform. Does anybody know what the shape of this distribution is? Someone in the back raised their hand really quick. Yeah, so maybe, uh, so, so just to repeat that, there's more ones than twos, more twos than threes. And for many kinds of uh, collections of numbers, you're gonna have like 30% of the digits, uh, uh, um, uh, 30% of leading digits, for example, will be ones. Okay, um, why might that be? Well, uh, I'll let you guys, uh, I'll let you, okay, actually, we have an answer. So uh, the short, uh, I'll explain it by giving it a name. It's called Benford's Law. You can look it up. And it basically says under a certain assumption of a scale invariance, which is uh, the, this multiplication by scale, you're going to have a lot of leading digits that are one. This is basically like when you look at kind of things logarithmically, the one takes up more space than the rest. OK, but it doesn't really matter, because that's not always the right answer, right? Um, if we were randomly generating numbers 32 bits, if we were randomly generating um, numbers, uh, we might actually find that that's not true, depending on what our randomly generated process was. What if we're doing zip codes and zip code recognition? What are we going to see a lot of? What about in California? What do you see a lot of in California? See a lot of nines, right? And so the actual distribution here is going to depend on things like, is there an underlying kind of structural thing going on, like Benford's law that, that shapes the data? Is there something about the domain we're working in, like it's zip codes in California? In general, the reasons why you don't just get uniform distributions, um, in some sense, they don't matter, because you're going to get data, and you're going to mimic what's ever in the data. So you're going to let the data drive this, rather than trying to do it from first principles. Okay, but those actually aren't the important, uh, the, you know, the prior distribution is important. Um, the most important thing that drives this is the function that links the classes to uh, the features. And so, for example, for this pixel right here, right, we have, it's either on or off. And we're going to have a distribution over on or off, which can be summarized by the probability of being on. We're going to have a distribution for each of the classes y. So, um, so for example, here, it might be that uh, it, in instances of the number one, this pixel is only on 1% of the time. But in instances of the number six, right, and if you think about it, six kind of goes like this, um, maybe 90% of the time that pixel is on. Okay, and so this fact that this pixel is unlikely for a one, but very likely for a six, when I see this is off, right, this tells me that, that um, I should, this, this tells me that one is more plausible than it was before I looked at this pixel, and six is less plausible. And taking each pixel's kind of soft contribution together is what the naive Bayes uh, classifier does. Okay, so there's that pixel, and there's gonna be some other pixel like this pixel. Maybe this pixel is almost always on for a three, but almost never on for a two. Okay, these are the parameters of the model, right? Um, these ones, we would learn them from counting up in our data how many um, instances of the digit one versus two versus three, and whether this is like a California zip code thing or Benford's law, that would come out of the data. Similarly, this entry here, the fact that a lot of threes have pixel five comma five on, um, that's something we would get from our data. Okay. All of these numbers together collectively, we write that as theta. That's the parameters of the model. Any questions on that? I haven't told you exactly how to get the numbers, but this is what they are. Okay, let's go back to text. We're always going to be jumping back and forth between these two because they're kind of important and very different. Um, in text, if we actually followed this recipe, we would say, all right, our features maybe are just the words in the document. 
Okay, we could do that for spam. It's probably not um, actually the best way to do spam recognition, um, but we would say, okay, why that's either spam or not, or for another text categorization, categorization problem. This could be, is this document sports or politics or whatever? Maybe you're building Google News and you want to like take this document and put it in the right news category. That would be a text categorization problem as well. Um, and they do. So um, then the other features are going to be the words. So the first word, the second word, the third word, as you, as you march through the document. You can think of the document as like the first word, the second word, the third word, and so on. And each one of these is a random variable. What word was the first one? Which word was the second one? And so on. Um, now, Naive Bay says this should be the prior probability of spam versus ham times, for each word, the probability of that word given the category. OK. And, and uh, in a standard Naive Bayes model, you would say that that means we need a distribution over what, is, what are the words that occur in the first position for a spam document? And what are the words that occur in the second position in a spam document? And what are the words that occur in the 73rd position of a spam document, right? And it turns out this doesn't work so well, because you, it takes a lot of data if you're going to separately learn about the 73rd and the 74th position in the document. And it turns out there's basically no real difference in these distributions. And when you have a bunch of distributions that you actually know they're kind of all the same thing, or you want to make the assumption that they're all the same thing, you can do what's called tying those distributions. You say there's actually only one distribution in play. There's a distribution over words independent of position given the class. OK, and that's called parameter tying. And um, formally, what we would say is we would say that each of the wi random variables are what's called identically distributed. They are governed by the same single set of uh, probabilities. OK, um, and in that, case, uh, in that case, what we would do is we would imagine that each of these words, the word at position i, this isn't word i in the dictionary or something like that, each one of these words is governed by the same distribution. Um, this is. There are a couple things people talk about here. This is identical distribution on the words. This is also called tying the parameters of these conditional probabilities. This model where you assume the words are um, identically distributed and kind of generated by a naive Bayes model is what's called the bag of words model. You may have heard this, bag of words classification. It's called a bag of words. You kind of, the, the idea is you'd like, what would a bag of words look like? I don't know, there'd be like a bag and there'd be some words in it. Um, but if, when, you have, when you have a bag of words, the idea here is that um, they're all jumbled up. The, the, the order doesn't matter, okay? And if you think about that, this means that in our model, I can take my email and the model is gonna say 92% spam. 84% ham, right? But then I can take those same emails and I can like scramble the words into a random order and I point it at the model and it still says 92% ham, 84% spam, right? And whatever, whatever uh, I might have just switched those, but whatever, um, whatever I order I put the words in, I'm going to get the same prediction out because all of the structure and the tying of the model, it basically has erased the dependence uh, on the position, right? And that might be crazy because we know that if you take if you take a, a kind of an, a, a document in English and you randomly permute the words, you've changed the document, right? It's not the same document. The reason why you can make such an uh, you can make an assumption in your uh, in your classification model that basically a document and a random permutation of that document are have the same probability in the model, even though one's kind of well-formed English and the other's just kind of word soup. Um, the reason why this is okay is because that scrambled document. To the extent that it's anything at all, it's still spam when you scramble it around and now it says email $1.99 address is free, right? It's, it's, it may not be English anymore, but it's kind of inherent spamliness and handliness hasn't swapped positions. That's why Naive Bayes often works, even though the independence assumption is, uh, is kind of very aggressive, because, um, because the dependence on order is actually kind of orthogonal to the topic uh, that's being classified. Now, if you were instead trying to say whether or not it's a good essay, it would be really important that the one that's in the right order gets one score and the one that's scrambled randomly gets a bad score. But for just topical decisions, when you scramble things up, you don't change their topic. You just make them hard to read. There's a question. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what about something like Google News? Uh, you're trying to decide whether this document is this a sports document, a politics document, a technology document, or whatever. And you scramble up all the words. And you can't read the thing anymore, but it's still about kind of, um, you know, uh, 
Um, it's still about, I don't know, iPad, iPhone, Apple, and even though you can't read it, it kind of hasn't transformed from technology into, um, into sports. It's just kind of gone from being in an order you can read to being in an order you can't. And in that case, these kinds of things will work well. Um, if, like I said, if instead you're trying to decide whether something's well formed, like for example, if you're, if you're building a machine translation system and you're trying to decide of a couple translations, I'd like to show the user something that's not gibberish, right? Scrambling up the words is probably a bad thing, right? And then you wouldn't be able to use these kinds of techniques. And we talk about MT, I'll talk about uh, uh, how people actually very much do not allow the words to, to reorder randomly. Any other questions? Okay. So that's naive Bayes. I'm going to show you some examples. So um, first of all, P of Y. What does this look like in the spam filtering case? Well, it's two numbers, probability of ham and probability of spam. What do you think the probability of spam is? That's the fraction of emails in the data set that are spam. 5%, 50%, anyone want to guess? I mean, it's just for this, email, this, this data set, because there's no way you could possibly know. Anyone want to make a wild guess how much spam there was in uh, 1998? Uh, so it's about two-thirds good, one-third bad. This was the good old days, right? Uh, I feel like I get more than one-third spam these days. Um, though spam filters work much better than they did. Actually, does anybody know why spam filters work so much better today than they did uh, like 10, 15 years ago? Whoa, too many answers. What? <laughs> what? More data. OK, more data. More data is good. More data, and I, I primed you guys for that. That is a big part of it. There's more data drawn. But it's not just that. Data is one thing, but don't, don't, don't think that data is the only thing. The other thing is features. There's better features than there were 10 years ago. What are the good, what are the killer features that tell you about spam that, that you didn't have before? Anybody know? So spam databases, actually, if you remember back all the way to the earliest kind of email clients and the earliest spam detectors, where was the spam detector? It's on your machine, right? So on your machine, what can the spam detector do? It can kind of like stare at the words and like, oh, the word free, that's kind of bad, right? Um, whereas when the spam detector is on the server, you can look at things like, oh, a million people just got this in the last 10 milliseconds, that's bad, right? And so there's actually kinds of information that you're able to leverage now that kind of email's at a different scale, um, and that enters into it too. So both of those things are important. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the parameters of a spam model. So if you have the probability, P of Y, that's boring. You even get it wrong, it probably won't matter, um, because it only gets multiplied in your model once, whereas there's word after word after word after word, and all the evidence about this document comes in kind of one word at a time. So what do you think the probability distribution over words in a spam document is? What's right at the top? What's the most likely word in a spam document? Okay, I heard free, anything else? Viagra. Okay, uh, no, it's, it's not inkjet printers, it's not singles, it's none of those things. Any completely different guess? Nigeria. It's not Nigeria. <laughs> it's the. You look at a spam and the word the is everywhere. And you say, hey, wait a minute, that's not really helpful, <laughs> right? And it's not, we'll actually see why it's not, but it's true. So if you look at the distribution of words in spam, right, the word the is actually quite common. And when you look at ham, it turns out the word the is quite common. Okay, so 2002, why is that in there? Um, uh, this data set, the end of this data set is 2002. There's a lot of 2002. Um, but that's kind of a silly artifact. It's not, it's not uh, irrelevant. It actually can be the case that you collect a data set today, and in four years, everything's totally different, right? For example, different products are being advertised through spam. And, these, and so sometimes you do need to continue collecting these things. Um, there's, there's, a, there's always going to be a kind of a difference between the training set and the test set when you build a classifier, because the training set is stuff you've seen and the test set is unknown. This is like the practice exams you study from are always going to be, you, you would always do better on a question from the practice exam because you've seen it than a question from an unknown exam. That's kind of an, that's a difference between the, the, the fact that you've observed one and not the other. There's also what's called corpus drift, where your training set was collected in 2002, and now it's whenever it is now, 2013, and things have just changed in the past 11 years, okay? And, and that's, a real, that's a real effect, too. Or you collected, you know, uh, only technology users who submitted their emails, and now you're trying to uh, apply it to a more wide set of users, and they get totally different kinds of emails. These things happen and you have to take them into uh, to consideration when you build these things. Okay, back to the point here. If you look at the parameters in a spam filter model, Dive Bayes says that you multiply in P of W given spam, and that means when you see the word the, you multiply in a big number. 
But if you remember the formula, the formula is that what we do in order to, um, in order to uh, compute the score is that for each hypothesis, once for spam and then once for ham, we multiply each factor in. So what we do is we say, all right, prior, right? I'm considering, could it be ham, could it be spam? For the one hypothesis I multiply in, you know, 0.66, and for the other one I multiply in 0.33, and then I move on to the first word, and the first word is the. So now the ham hypothesis, I multiply in um, 0.21, and on the spam hypothesis, I multiply in 0.15 or 0.16, whatever, something like that. So you multiply word by word, and so it doesn't matter whether these numbers are big or not. It matters whether the ratio between the two numbers and the two columns is big, because what you're gonna compare is this product to this product. And so when I, you know, before I start off, ham is winning by a factor of two, right? Because that's what the data says. And then when I multiply in, I see the word the, and I multiply in the 0.2 and the 0.16, well, it doesn't matter whether they're both big or both little. It matters here in this case that the is slightly more common in ham. And so when you see the, you have a tiny little bit of increase in your confidence in ham because words that aren't like annoying spammy words kind of give you a slight indication that this is going to be a better email, but it's not like it was unlikely in the other. And then you might, for example, get to free. And if you get to free, then what you'll see is in, in um, spam, it may only be 0.00. Um, zero 0.09, right? But, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be that low, but then in ham, it might be like 0 0.0001. And so even though they're both now small, you get a factor of nine advantage. So the important thing in this classification isn't whether these numbers are big or little, it's whether their ratio kind of points one way or the other. So it's the relative probabilities. You collect the probabilities, but the thing that drives your classification is their, uh, what's called the odds ratio. Okay, one means they're equally likely in both and it doesn't contribute to the, the classification, and then either direction skewed away from one will push one way or the other. Okay, any questions about that? Um, let's do an example. So I get an email and I haven't looked at the words yet, and that means that I think there's a 66% chance that it's ham. Formally, I'm going to be multiplying these, uh, these factors. Every word I see, I'm going to multiply in a factor. And when I multiply all these probabilities, the numbers get very small very quickly. In practice, you can get underflow. People often work with the logs of these numbers. And so what I'm showing here is the product of everything so far, which is just 0.3 and 0.6, and I'm showing its log. Okay, so that 0.3, when you take the log, you get minus 1.1. That 0.6, when you take the log, you get minus 0.4. And when you look at these, of course they're both negative because they're logs of uh, numbers less than one. And when you look at them, this says ham is winning, right? Because it's a bigger number, meaning uh, less negative. Okay, so everybody clear what we're looking at here? So let's, let's see the first word in our email. Gary. Okay, Gary is not a common word in a generic kind of set of emails. If your name's Gary, it's probably pretty common for you. But, um, but for a generic classifier, Gary isn't very common. However, it's much more common in ham, right? Does that make sense? Kind of makes sense because some fraction of people are called Gary and their emails have Gary, but spam just generally goes out and says kind of dear sir, right? Um, and so before we saw this, we thought this was probably ham. We see Gary and now we have like a 10x boost in our confidence that this is a good email, because it's got the guy's name in it. All right, so we keep going. Wood, okay, wood's like the, right? It appears in all kinds of emails, but the fact that it's not the word free means it's kind of slightly gonna increase your confidence that this is a good or ham email. Okay, Gary Wood, you. Okay, you's actually bad, it's a generic reference. You wouldn't have thought this. If I asked you, hey, is you more common or ham or spam? The right answer is like, I don't know, right? But if you look at your data, it turns out it's actually like twice as common, a little more than that um, in spam emails. Like, okay, fine. So now what's happening here as you multiply them together is if you look at kind of the running product, ham is still winning, but it's winning less than it was before we saw the word you. And this is how this works. Every word comes in and none of these words are kind of, uh, are, are kind of deterministic. None of these words, even the word free, they don't instantly kill one of the hypotheses. They very slowly push the evidence one way or the other. This is what's called aggregating evidence, and this is really the big story of success of machine learning um, in the past 15 years, is the ability to take lots of weak pieces of evidence and kind of merge them all together into one decision. Okay, Gary, would you like to lose weight while you sleep? Okay, it's... <laughs> 
It started so well, right? There was Gary, but then there was lots of little signals, none of which is that strong, right? Um, you know, sleep is more common in spam in this corpus, but not, it's not like you don't ever say it in another email, right? And so when you add everything up, right, this is a joint probability. We multiplied a bunch of small numbers together. So it, you have to take the log, right? So otherwise, I'd be writing 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. We don't want to do that. So these are, uh, these are their log values. And you can see spam actually won. It's less, incredibly it's less incredibly negative in log. And that means it's less close to 0. It's a bigger number. And what happened here was there's some evidence towards spam. And there's evidence towards ham. And there's some words that kind of stayed out of the decision, like uh, like two here happens to stay out of the decision mostly. And uh, when, you, when you kind of aggregate everything, this is how the balance comes out. You can kind of take these, their probabilities. I'd have to exponentiate them to get the actual probabilities. And then I can uh, normalize them to get the probability of spam and ham. And the answer is, according to the naive Bayes model, the probability of spam is 98.9. There's actually a lesson here just in that number. There's, you know, there's kind of some evidence in both directions. And even though you and I look at this and we laugh and it's obviously spam, and so you say, okay, 98.9. 98.9 is probably too confident. That's probably some overconfidence. Even though this is a probabilistic model and it's making a prediction, here the prediction is spam, it's probably overconfident. Why is it overconfident? Because it took all of this evidence. It assumed each piece of evidence was independent, and they weren't, right? A lot of this evidence, um, for example, lose and wait. Right? Once you've seen lose, for better or for worse, the next word is pretty likely to be wait, spam or no, spam or no spam. Right? And so because you assume these two things that both indicate spam did so independently, when in fact really it's the same thing. It's kind of this is a lose wait kind of email. Right? Um, because you, t you take pieces of evidence that are actually um, correlated and you assume that they're not, right? you tend to uh, believe uh, you tend to believe more strongly in whatever you predict. And so one of the things you often see in a naive Bayes classifier is even when the classifications are very accurate, the confidences are usually way overconfident. Uh, they're usually way overcalibrated. And um, you actually see this with generative models everywhere. So for example, we talked about HMMs, particle filterings for tracking robots. Very often, the whole cloud of uh, your belief distribution over the robot's location will collapse down to a single point, even when that's not where the robot is. And that's another instance of overconfidence. Overconfidence tends to come from, um, a, from independence assumptions that are not true, but that you make for modeling expedience. And in general, every independence assumption you make is not true. Some are just more not true than others. And so you're always going to get some amount of overconfidence. Any questions on the spam example? OK, so, um, so for example, uh, maybe if we knew this was Gary, and we built a special spam classifier for Gary, the probability of, uh, of Gary given ham should be really high. So this is a kind of speaker, this is a, this is a user independent classifier. We could build one just for him, and that would mean we'd have to devise what is his training set. Is it just his emails, or is it his emails plus everybody else's, but his have more weight? Um, that's actually a, uh, what's instance of, uh, an instance of what's called domain adaptation, where you want to customize the classifier for a specific subset of the instances. Um, and that's actually an open research problem. But there are some easy ways to get some mileage, like just take his email and, and make them count for you know, 100 times the others. OK, other questions on the spam example. So you're not going to build a spam classifier in your Project 5. Actually, there was an earlier version of Project 5 where you did, uh, but like. There's some pretty weird stuff in the spam, and I, I didn't know how UC Berkeley would feel about that in the uh, assignment. So you're going to do digits, but you're not going to do spam. Instead of spam, you're going to do uh, what's called behavioral cloning for Pac-Man. And I'll show you an example of that later, but not today. OK. Um, let's take a quick break, and then we'll talk about training versus testing and the actual methodology you use now that you know the models. OK. All right, let's start again. Let's take a step back from the math for a second, and let's think about this process of training and testing. And you can relate to this in terms of kind of your own experiences. Um, there's a phase where you're taught things, like kind of, uh, um, you know, in this in this uh, in this in this cartoon, it's what's an apple, what's a car. But for the classifier, this is how often is this pixel on for the digit seven, right? 
you have to get that from data. And that process is called training, right? There is then a testing phase where you take what you know, you take these parameters, and you check to see with, you check to see once you have, once you've learned these parameters, how well do they work on unseen instances, right? And that's where you go and you take your final exam in a class, and you see kind of how well what you learn from the training instances, which was lecture or homework or whatever, how well you can then generalize to the final exam. Now, we also have things in a class like a practice exam. What's a practice exam? Well, a practice exam is something, it's not like your training data where you know the answers already, but it's supposed to be like the exam, but you're going to get told how well you did so that you can maybe learn at a slightly kind of higher, a slightly meta level. So you, the, the, there's the details you learn from, from lecture or whatever, and then there's the practice exam, you learn something that's a little bit more abstract, like did I study right, or are there areas I need to spend more time on? And this is gonna be a distinction that occurs in classification as well. There's the core training, there's a little bit of tuning, which you can think of as like a practice exam, and then there's how the, 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 this artifact actually performs um, on data it's never seen, and that's like a final exam. So uh, these concepts have names, and uh, the kind of methodology here is very important, because if you get this wrong, it can actually uh, really mess up uh, performance in practice. So you get your data, and in your data you have a bunch of emails, each one is marked ham or spam. What do you do with this data? You actually divide it into a couple pieces. The kind of biggest chunk of the data is what's called your training data. You're gonna use that to figure out the parameters of your model, like what fraction of spam emails contain the word free. That's most of your data. But you're gonna have other bits of data that you hold out, okay? And kind of the, um, the simplest, uh, kind of data you hold out is what's called the test set or the test data, where you take some of these instances that are just like the training data, but you don't use them to learn anything about the various words. Instead, you keep them hidden, you bring them in at the end as an exam for your classifier to see how well it does on new data, right? Um, that's because there's a worry, it's called overfitting, when you build a classifier, that it's gonna memorize the training data and do really well in the training data, but fail to generalize to new instances, okay? There's another thing called held out data, which is like a practice exam. And we'll see later um, uh, what the held out data is for. So you have data, you construct features, which are these attribute value pairs that characterize each instance. You come up with those, right? There's something called feature induction where the system tries to come up with them automatically. But for most classification tasks, you brainstorm the features and you write the snippet of codes that compute how many connected components are in the image or how many capital letters or whatever you think is important, okay? The cycle when you do these experiments is something like this. You go to your training set, you learn the bulk of the parameters, kind of how likely is it that this pixel is on in the number of set, in the number seven and so on. You learn all of that from the training data. That's the big chunk of data. Um, you're gonna then check to see, does this naive base classifier trained with these features on this data, does it work on my test set? So that would be kind of a train and test experimental cycle. There's one more thing you need to do. So for example, you might decide, um, uh, you might have to uh, make some small adjustments to what kind of classification you're doing. You would do that on another data set that's like the practice exam, and that's called a held out uh, data set. So one important thing is you never want to let your classifier peek at the test set, right? If you had access to the final exam um, during your studying, you would do better, right? Um, but, uh, and, and that's fine if you want your classifier to look really good in the lab and work poorly in the real world. If this classifier is not gonna work, you wanna find out. And so you don't wanna give it the test before you have it take the test. So you keep all of the test data separate, and that way when you point it at the test data and it gets 98% correct, you are confident that in the real world on data you've never even seen before, it's gonna keep getting 98%. If you let the test data be part of the training set, you're gonna run your classifier, it's gonna get 100%, you're gonna think you've solved this problem, and then you deploy it and it's wrong all the time, and uh, how would you know? So it's very important that your test data be removed from the training process. Okay, evaluation. How do you tell how good a classifier is? There's actually a lot of metrics. A lot of them have to do with risk and utility. Like, for example, in a spam classifier, um, it's not equally bad to put a spam message in someone's inbox as it is to take a message from their box and put a message from their boss and put it into their spam box. Right? That's much worse. And when you have asymmetric risks like that, then you don't just want to count up um, uh, how many things you got right. But the standard me measure of accuracy is just how many of things are predicted correctly. But realize that that's not always the right thing. 
And then finally, the kind of uh, important concept that we've been alluding to is something called overfitting and generalization. We'll talk about these in detail today and also for the next couple days as well. Um, you want a classifier which does well on test data, not on the training data. If I wanted to build a classifier that was really good on the training set for spam, I would just hash the email um, and then have a lookup function that looks at the hash of the email and just regurgitate, or forget the hash, just something that looks up the email in my database and returns the answer. It would be a lookup table, and it would be perfect on the training instances, and it would be totally useless on any unseen email because it wouldn't be in the database. And that's, that's kind of your worst nightmare in classification, that somehow you've managed to build a system which has completely captured the training set and can answer any question perfectly on the training set, but totally wipes out on unseen instances. And in that case, a lookup table is very good at fitting the training data, but that's overfitting, right? It hasn't generalized to other data. OK, we'll look at them uh, formally later, but we're going to kind of see them a little bit today. So you think about this as like buying a hat for your, your robot, right? You want that hat to fit just right. This hat is the hypothesis. You want it to fit the training set. Um, so you don't want it to just ignore. So another, a way. A, a way to overfit maximally for spam is to just have a lookup table that just says, if, it's, uh, if, if I've seen this uh, email, it's whatever I saw it as. Otherwise, it's spam. 100% accuracy on the training set. Totally useless. That's an extreme case of overfitting. Here's the extreme case of underfitting. You just always say um, two-thirds two, two -thirds chance of spam, uh, sorry, two-thirds chance of ham and one-third chance of spam. You don't even look at the document. This isn't overfit. It does just as well on the test set as the training set. It just doesn't do well anywhere. right? This is something that's underfit. You haven't even looked at your data. And you want something that's somewhere in between. You want to fit the patterns in your training set so that you learn from that, but you want to do it in a way that your learning applies to the test set as well. You want to kind of find a happy medium. And that trade-off between overfitting and underfitting can be made formal in multiple ways, um, though we're not going to do that today. Um, I'm going to illustrate it. Uh, you've seen this before. You saw this when we talked about uh, reinforcement learning. And the question is, for, um, for dots like this, what should be our hypothesis? So if I could only choose constant functions, right? my hypothesis would be something like this. right? Uh, pretend that's a straight line. Um, that, my hypothesis would be something like that. That's kind of the best you can do with a constant function, and you haven't fit the pattern in the data. This is a case of underfitting. The reason you underfit is because your hypothesis class wasn't rich enough or complex enough to capture what's going on in the data. So I could say, instead of fitting constant functions, I'm going to fit a line. Right? Now I fit better, but I still haven't fit very well. I could go to quadratic functions. Now I'm going to fit pretty well. Um, in both, I've kind of, uh, my residuals are small on my training set. And it's like just eyeballing this, it seems reasonable that it's going to generalize well to unseen data. Um, but it kind of, if I did this kind of to the extreme and I kept fitting and fitting and fitting, at some point I would get to some polynomial that kind of hits everything, but it, you know, only really has good behavior where these points are. And so you can think about this, even though this one is for regression, which is different than classification, intuitively this idea is really what's going on. That as you're, the set of, of classifiers that you might learn grows, when it's really small, you kind of can't learn anything. When it's really big, you can memorize your training set in a way that doesn't, uh, that doesn't generalize. And what you want is kind of a happy medium, a set of classifiers that's rich enough to learn what's in your training set, but only in ways that are going to actually generalize. Carrying that intuition through, by the way, is like a huge fraction of the machine learning research that has gone on and will go on in the future. So it's, not, it's easier said than done. OK, so overfit, that's bad. We're going to see some examples of overfitting. Um, so um, let's imagine we're going to say whether or not this particular, so this is a made up example, we're going to say whether or not this particular image is a 3 or a 2. And we look at it and we're like, oh, that should be a 3. Right, so how does Naive Bayes do that? Well, we have the two hypotheses competing. So for each one, we look at each feature and we multiply in um, a, a, a factor into our score. So the first factor is from the prior. Maybe they're equally likely, right? This is some, some domain where twos and threes are equally likely. Then I go feature by feature. So this feature, for example, um, it's equally likely to be present in a two or a three, so I multiply that in. And these two hypotheses are still neck and neck. They're equal. They're, we've multiplied everything together, and they're equally likely. It'll say 50-50 chance if we normalize. All right, then we go to this fe feature here. This feature is much, this pixel is much more likely to be on, apparently, for a three. And so now the hypothesis of three is winning by a factor of nine. Now we see that there's no uh, pixel here, and maybe off for this pixel is seven times more likely in a three than in a two, because a two would have ink there. 
So now there's like a factor of, what is it, 63 more likely for three. So, so far, Naive Bayes is doing its thing. It's taking evidence wherever it finds it, and the hypothesis of three is kind of is dominating here. But then you might have some noise pixel here that's kind of almost never on anywhere. It's almost never on for a two, and it's never on at all for a three. But if we multiply in 1% for a two, because there was one example of a two that had it, and zero for a three, um, you know, the product here is small. What's the product on the right? Zero. So all of a sudden, that factor of 63 advantage, it's gone. Right? One zero in your product will just completely kill a hypothesis. And so this is bad. Yes, it's true that in your data, that pixel was never on for a digit three. But you still don't want to say that it never could be on. And so this is overfitting. It's one of the many kind of overfitting shows up in many concrete ways. This is one way overfitting shows up when your probabilities stay zero when they're not. OK. Zero in the training set doesn't mean zero in the test set. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, very well put. This is, uh, this is very related to the brain teaser last time. Just because the sun hasn't ever failed to rise doesn't mean that someday, some small probability, it won't. And so we don't want to give probabilities of zero. So we don't want two to win. Um, this act happens all over. So if you look at ham versus spam, you think, what is the word that is m has the greatest odds ratio? Remember, this is what determines classification. What are the words that are much more likely in ham than spam? Or much more likely in spam? So what do you think are the words that are more likely in ham? Maybe that's hard to answer. What are, what's more likely in spam? You think, oh, finally, that's where free goes. Like, no. OK, the words that are most likely in ham compared to spam are these words that had zero probability in, sp in spam, but small probability in ham. They're not likely anywhere, but the zeros just totally skew everything. Similarly, the things that relatively occur more often in spam are the things that happen to occur once in a spam document, but never in a ham document. So this, is, this isn't right, right? These rare things, we don't know anything about them. We only saw them once, maybe. We certainly don't want them to be the most powerful features. We want to somehow um, smooth or regularize them away so that they kind of, they, they're a little bit more balanced in their prediction of the future. OK, so what went wrong here? Well, okay. Overfitting, right? But what, what really went wrong is you assign something a probability of zero just because you haven't seen it yet. So for naive Bayes, uh, there's a specific way you combat this kind of overfitting by estimating probabilities in ways that do not give rise to zeros everywhere. Um, just because we never saw a, a three with that pixel doesn't mean we won't see it later. Just because um, we only ever saw the word seriously in ham doesn't mean it couldn't show up in spam. You, you could probably invent a spam in your mind right now that has the word seriously in it. Um, there are even words that didn't occur at all, and you don't want to see like a word you've never seen before, or a, a, you know, an integer you've never seen before, and be like, yeah, I have no idea what's going on. That never occurs, right? Um, you want to somehow deal with these things robustly. And in general, you don't want to go around giving unseen things probability zero. Um, all right, so this gets rise to the parameter es estimation uh, brain teaser I gave last time. Um, we can think of the jelly beans here as uh, just a generic placeholder for some distribution. Like the jelly beans could be the different word, the colors could be different words in the language, or they could be whether the pixel's on or off. And every time we see a training example, we get to draw something from this jelly bean uh, jar, and we get to see, oh, this time we did see this word in a spam. But there's, you know, there's the true population, and there's the samples we get. Okay, so. Um, we we'll go through this. Uh, we, we did this. Uh, we did this last time, but we're going to go through it in a little more depth today. Um, if we want to estimate the the distribution of a random variable, we could ask. So I could go to you and say, "How likely is the word free and spam?" And you would say, "I've gotten a lot of spam, but I have no idea." And that would be totally legitimate for you to say. And so we don't generally ask humans for these things, right? We could do it empirically instead. We could go to our training set, and that's what we're actually going to do when we do learning. So we could look at empirical rates. So we talked about this last time. If you see two red jelly beans and one blue jelly bean, well, first, it should be obvious that you should get more draws of the jelly beans. But if you had to stop here, you might say 2 thirds red, or at least that's the obvious estimator to use. OK, this is what's called the maximum likelihood estimate. It's the count of each, it's proportional to the counts of occurrence, and it's the number of times red occurred divided by the total number of samples. So in this case, the maximum likelihood estimate from this data here is that red is 2 thirds probability. OK. Um, probably wrong, but the maximum likelihood estimate will get better as you get more samples. Um, why do we call it maximum likelihood? Because it maximizes what's called the likelihood of the data. So what's that? OK, let's actually write down the likelihood of the data. The likelihood of the, uh, the data, right? the data is fixed. It's a thing. It's sitting there in front of you. And as I change the probability of red, 
this data becomes more or less likely. So for example, if I imagined that the probability of res is the variable r, and I said, how likely is it that three draws would produce two r's, would produce r, r, b in that order? Well, the first draw being r is probability r. The second draw being r is probability r, so that's r squared. What's the probability of getting a b? Well, it's b, right? But that's one minus r. So do you agree that that product, right, that's how likely this particular data set is? So as I change r, the likelihood of this data set will go up and down. If b is really common, meaning r is really small, you're not going to see this kind of thing very often. So what I could do is I could say, all right, what is the value of r that maximizes this likelihood, uh, this likelihood quantity? How could I figure that out? You like go back to calculus, right? You take some derivatives and you say, all right, that's r squared minus r to the third. We're going to take a derivative and set equal to zero. That's 2r, let's see if I can still do calculus, minus r squared. That has to be equal to 0. Uh, we know r equals 0 isn't the solution we're looking for, so that means that 2 has to equal 3r, and that means r equals, that means uh, r equals 2 thirds. Okay, so good. Maximum likelihood derived right there. You, this generalizes in the obvious way to multiple values. So that's fine, and it's mathematically reasonable, but we know it's going to have a tendency to overfit because something that didn't occur. Right, the most likely reason, or the, the parameter for which it is most likely to not occur would be zero, because it's just not going to occur. Everything else has a chance. So what we need is we need something that's called uh, smoothing here. This is when you're kind of, your agent's a little more chill and not surprised by unseen events. Right? So uh, he is, he's, he's happy because he didn't assign this guy probability zero. He just has a low probability. right? Um, and we would like to have our classifiers not be surprised by unseen events like this. OK. So, um, Basically, here's an argument. I'll give you an argument, then I'll give you a procedure, um, and then we'll be done for today. So the argument is the relative frequency estimators that are overfitting are the ones that make the data most likely. right? And so we could kind of work that out. We could write down the likelihood of the data, and then we solve. We write down some partial derivatives, and we solve, and this is what you get. OK, instead what you could do is you could say, that's not really what I want. I have my data, I'm Bayesian, and what I want to do is I want to consider the, pr the parameters which are most likely given the data. And if I don't think probability zero is very likely, then somehow I need to weigh my prior belief that zero is not a likely probability against my evidence, which does actually support zero pretty well. And then weighing those two things can be phrased formally instead of a maximum likelihood estimate as a maximum a posteriori estimate, which says I'd like the theta, which is most likely given my evidence. And what we can just kind of write out the definition here with Bayes' rule. That still has the likelihood of your data, but there's a new term that says whether or not you think certain parameters are more likely than others. And if what you think is that for parameters theta, you think 0.5 is reasonable, but 0 and 1 aren't, you should have like some, some distribution over your parameters that says, all right, uh, I need to balance my prior against my evidence, and then you'll come up with something more reasonable. Formally, what you get is um, the answer to this brain teaser, which is um, how do you deal with the fact that the sun um, someday isn't going to rise, even though you've always seen it rising? And uh, um, Laplace's answer was, what you should do is you should imagine everything, every outcome that could happen happened once more than you've actually seen it. Meaning before you see anything, you think everything's happened once. So for example, when I see RRB, I imagine there's kind of the Laplace, Laplace's fake red and fake blue, what are sometimes called pseudo events or pseudo counts, in addition. So the maximum likelihood, ap uh, the maximum likelihood here says 2 thirds, 1 third. The Laplace estimate adds 1, and you get 3 fifths, 2 fifths, which is closer to uniform. Okay. If you only saw one red, you would still say 2 thirds, 1 third, which is much better than saying 1 and 0. You can be a little bit more sophisticated with this. Uh, this is the last thing we're going to do today. You can be a little bit more sophisticated this and, and say, pretend everything happened k times, where k is a parameter. So if you pretend some, you, if you see red, red, blue, and you pretend they each have an extra zero count, you get two thirds, one third. If you imagine they each have one count, you get three fifths, two fifths. And if you imagine they each have an extra hundred counts, then you basically get 50 50 because your prior is so strong, right? You kind of imagine that before you see anything, you're pretty sure it's very balanced. K here is called the strength of a prior. And um, one of the things you need to do in a naive Bayes model is crank up and down the strength. Um, uh, you need to crank up and down the strength until you get uh, something that achieves the right amount of generalization. OK, well, quick question, and then we're, out of, I think, out of time today.
Oh, yeah, okay, good question. How do you know what the event space is for your random variable? Um, sometimes you don't. There's even, uh, there's even a lot of work into trying to figure out what to do with the kind of long tail. But the most common cases you do for some reason, like you know it's either gonna be ham or spam, or you know here's an inventory of words I'm willing to consider. Like a dictionary, something like that. Okay, anyway, this is a very crude kind of smoothing. We'll talk about something more sophisticated at the beginning of next class.